Hello. Can everyone hear me? Excellent. That's good. All right. Uh, well, let me know. I know it is just turn two. Let me know if maybe we should wait a little bit, you know, let people get back from lunch, all that good stuff, dinner, late breakfast for the West Coasters. Okay. Awesome. Well, hello. Uh, then let's go ahead and start. Uh, feel free to toss in questions to pu pu public chat. Um, Elette Evans says, oh, you people are lovely. That is, that sounds wonderful. I have a very nice big cup of water with lime in it here, but I think I'll definitely have tea afterwards. Um, all right. So like I said, go ahead and feel free to leave questions and I have saved room for them at the end. Um, but if they do kind of fit into what I'm talking about, I will try to answer them, them then. So uh, anyway, let's get started. So I am Monica A. Hins Madden, and this talk is all about creating kind of state of your communities or organizations reopen source, namely their past and their present, to kind of chart your open source future. And I, in my day job, am the Ubuntu community representative at Canonical. And this talk is based on kind of some of the stuff I did when I got started uh, six months previously. So when we're faced with the prospect of kind of creating a, either creating a com community and, or being kind of entrusted with community leadership or creating or taking responsibility for an open source program office, we tend to get a little bit fixated on the future. We want to live there because the future is where awesome, exciting things are happening. And this is what it's, it's easy to kind of want to just mentally be there. The past, who knows what happened? You might be new. You might literally have no idea what happened in your organization's past. The present, meh, it's something that you're dealing with, but you don't especially want to be be there. You want to think of what are the fantastic things that your open source project or your open source program office will be doing. And however, this might be kind of mentally where uh, how a lot of us kind of operate, but it's not the most helpful starting point. Because actually, where you should start with is your organization's past. And as I said, this is something that was born out of, this is a practical um, information uh, uh, series. And this is born out of a very practical project I was given uh, when I started. So the community I am a part of is nearly 20 years old. I've only been familiar with it for a, for a few years. So when I started this past February on the community team, my manager at that time was like, you know what you need to do is make a report on the state of the c community, going to its starting with its past, going through the, its transitions, see where it is now, and then that's what we're going to use to make our roadmap. It was extraordinarily helpful. And so that's why when I was asked to talk at the O um, at, at this little mini co conference, that's what I chose because it was an extremely useful task for even thinking about what should our, our future goals be what are going to be some of the hurdles and how do we kind of measure how we're going to get there 
And so this also, I don't know if there's anybody who is from kind of an academic organization who's here, but this is something that if you are part of an academic um, open source project or open source program office, this is something that will be in your wheelhouse because a lot of this draws on research and synthesis and kind of distilling a lot of information into digestible, useful takeaways. Uh, this is something that I think that people coming from an academic slash research background are uniquely suited to handle. And for me, I think that's why my manager gave it to me because I came from academia. I did a lot of history work in my past life. And so he said, this is something that you will probably be able to handle. And I think he was right. So going to your organization or your project's past, I kind of broke this down into there's three possible positions or kind of backgrounds that your organization or project might have. Positive, negative, and neutral. Chances are your organization is going to have a little mix of all three. But what we're going to di discuss is how those different experiences are going to impact your project not only in the present but in the future. And this is gained through a variety of means. Certainly the first thing you want to do is if there are people in your organization, like if you are coming from an existing project or let's say you're in an organization that has some familiarity or experience with open source. Find your sources of institutional knowledge. Those people who have all kinds of information up here that maybe hasn't been put down. You're also going to find this in things like mailing lists, in forums, in IRC logs and blog posts. I was extraordinarily lucky and found an anthropologist who literally embedded himself into the Ubuntu community in 2006 and wrote his anthropology thesis on it. So chances are if you can find someone who may have worked with your group or a group very similar, use all those all those sources. And this can kind of help you because you you find that these accounts start to match up. And so you know that it's not just this person's experience, that this was a shared history. And that can give you some confidence that the picture you're painting of your organization's past is actually a fairly accurate it, um, a fairly accurate interpretation. So the more sources you can have for this, the better. So once you have those sources of information, these are the kinds of things that I found m myself pulling out and what I wanted to share in this short half hour talk. So you want to look for if those positive experiences your project or organization has had because those are going to give you in the present an existing foundation of open source knowledge. So that way your hurdles might be a little less a little less high and you have people who are familiar with dynamics, tool sets and some of the challenges that come with either an open source project or an open source project office. This also gives you the potential for an easier transition. So like, and this is specifically more towards those open source project offices, that if you have people in your organization who are 
extremely familiar and experienced. And, and if they are still have strong lines of communication, or better yet, if they're still in your organization, then starting your open source pr um, project office up will probably be a much easier task. But there's also a potential downside that you may have high internal and external expectations. And if you've had negative or neutral or no experiences, then you're not going to have this problem. And so this is something to be alert for, because if you were known for having an extraordinarily uh, dynamic community, or maybe let, let's say you're in your you're setting up an academic office and you had a researcher who collaborated extraordinarily with open source projects, then this is going to, it will ease that transition, but you also have kind of this, these higher expectations to clear. And you might wonder, it's like, why are people expecting us to be doing all these things? when you don't realize that, oh, it's because you have this very positive reputation and these expectations that both your internal and, uh, and external stakeholders might have. You can also have negative experiences. This, like the positive one, means that you do have a previous knowledge foundation. You've been working in these open source spaces. And so again, your your knowledge and experience hurdle isn't going to be as high. But unlike the positive one, you then have the hurdles of a negative reputation to overcome. It might be it like, in our case, that where we had shifted kind of our interactions with the community about eight years in to the project. And so we had kind of pulled back from our community, not engaged as heavily, made decisions without the same level of community input. And so we needed to be extraordinarily careful of when we make decisions in the present that we have these precedents of past decisions that are coloring people's reactions, that are influencing um, what both internal and external audiences are going to think. And so we had to weigh the consequences of previous missteps and mistakes because there was going to be perhaps less patience, less forgiveness, and a little less grace extended to us versus maybe a group that had overwhelmingly positive reputation or was completely new. And so, yeah, and so if you're exactly, Jeff, because if you, if your organization isn't seen as trustworthy, like let's say, I don't know, you're the University of Minnesota in the future and you're trying to set up your program office and you kind of forgot about what happened with, you know, the uploads, uh, the um, request sent to the lit Linux kernel with known bugs. You're going to have a huge hurdle to overcome there. And for things that are not your fault, you are not those previous people, but you do carry the burden of your community or organization's actions. And it does take a lot of time to fix that. Oh, and that is, yeah. And Kevin also has a really good point that, uh, that there is a packet and yeah, because you have to think of the reputation also of who's publishing the projects that you want to contribute 
contribute to because that is going to be an issue for your open source project office of five or 10 years from now, or even sooner. It's like you all worked with them and then that becomes an issue. So having a broad chronological context and realize that your the, the actions of your organization in the past do weigh really heavily into what pe people think. So yeah, and this is one of the things that if you're just looking at this from the contribution side, you're like, no, but it's contribution, that's good. And it can be, but you have to realize that there are emotional and moral and philosophical decisions happening. And you have to realize that they are going to impact you. And they should guide your plans. Because if they guide your plans, it's so much better than them derailing your plans that you construct without thinking about them. So we have the positive influences, we have the negative influences, but then we have, what about if your organization's completely shiny and new is a blank slate? You're like, well, this isn't a problem for us because we don't have anything there. That's possibly true. But you should also take advantage of the resources and the research you can do to a, find out about what previous attitudes have been. Maybe there's not an open source program office because some of the people in your organization or group might have gotten burned. Maybe they felt that there were hurdles that kept them from establishing this. And so if there were previous um, kind of blockages in the past and those haven't been dealt with, then those are something that you're going to want to uncover. And But also there are similar organizations to yours and this is when it's good to reach, um, especially if you have strong networks, that to reach out to groups that maybe have a similar function or purpose. Also, if you're coming from an academic or a non profit think of groups that are of a similar size don't like if you're a tiny liberal arts college or a teeny tiny non-profit maybe draw on the experiences of other small resource limited groups because you don't want to look at a large research oriented school or a large nonprofit with a huge budget and all kinds of people and then wonder why you can't do the same things that they did. So uh, use experiences, reach out, find ways to like contact groups like the OSI and say, hey, we're thinking of doing this. This is who we are. This is what we do. Can you tell us about any other groups or organizations like ours who have done this who might want to talk to us and just talking to people, getting their lived experience is just, it's such a helpful thing. So this took me a few weeks to undo. I, again, this was talking with people. I found it, you know, this was a combination. It was emails, it was face-to-face -face calls. It was going through a whole bunch of blog posts. We were lucky and had that thesis that was specifically about our community, but there's also a lot of academic resources out there on open source involvement. And if you're new to this, I would definitely stress maybe giving those a read and I'll try to come up with a list for some of them, uh, like especially for some of the articles that I found. Because again, this was, I was, this was very much new. And so I just needed to get myself familiar with our community and which again is how this was so useful. But you don't have to just consider your past. You want to think about, well, what is our current state? And so here you want to take an inventory. Now that can mean a variety of different things. 
Uh, if you if this is setting up an OSPO, you want to think of okay, what what open source software are we using? What open source software are we contributing to, or do we want to? So that way, you just you just kind of you have a better, clearer picture. If you are an open source project, having an idea of not only what your contributor base is, but how active your contributor base is, um, how basically how diverse, um, it, because if you have, especially if it's if it seems like there's a lot of activity, and you just had, but that activity is being driven by one person, not healthy at all. So you, because you want to know what your, what your capacities are. And then the second part, I would say, gather trusted feedback. Have a, find a group of core contributors or stakeholders who are really passionate about, um, about establishing your project and people who will both give you constructive feedback, but honest and make sure that you're touching base with them and and ask them you know not only about you know and chances are these are people you've asked about the past if they are people who are still active in your organization but also these are the people who will be the core drivers of your project ask them about their time com commitment ask them about um previous things and yes Georg I'm so glad you're here because yes the bus factor you don't want a bus factor of one that's bad but having this group of core people that you talk to on a regular cadence that might be once a week when you're starting up that might go down to once a month or once a quarter once you're established but have a regular group of people who will be kind of guiding your roadmap in the future future and will give you feedback on saying, oh, this could be more ambitious or wow, you are planning way too much there. And this has been extremely valuable. But don't just get people who are going to cheer on everything that you do. And don't just get people who are going to shoot everything down. Find someone who's got that happy medium there. And also assess your met metrics. How can you gauge participation? How can you gauge contribution? How can you see kind of what the health of your community or organization is? And how about that? Uh, Chaos has an amazing set of metrics and they're having their very own, just a complete con that's just, just run by them in two weeks. Talk to Georg about that. So Definitely. And if you do not have to reinvent wheels, don't reinvent wheels. Find tool sets. Use them. Make your life so much easier here. Also, no, and but also, and this is something that I'm sure that Georg or anybody in metrics will tell you, don't assess everything. Don't measure everything. Find out what are the key things you need to measure and find out trustworthy way of measuring measuring those. And usually what the key things you're going to measure are things that are going to help you realize your future. Because now you have found the influences from your past. You know you have an accurate picture of your state in the present. Now is when you can start thinking about your future because you're prepared. So you, you want audacious but achievable goals. You want something that people are going to go, wow, yeah, oh my gosh, this is inspiring, but something that within six months to a year you can accomplish. And once you have those goals in place, then you want those concrete steps to help you get there. And again, thinking about that kind of six month to a year timeline is helpful. And then you want those metrics that are showing you Am I doing what I need to to achieve this goal? And then the last thing, and this is kind of for a long-term success of your project, that you want to bake 
these open source community processes and make it so that it's just second nature. It's just part of you. It's like it's in your organization's DNA and that's done by habits. And so, and so think about how can we be tra transparent? How can we be measurable? And as much as you can, just make that a part of your organizations, like this is just what we do, standard. Then the more that is when you bring new people in, they're just going to adapt to that. And it will overall be a better, uh, a better experience. And that, in a very brief nutshell, is how road is how understanding your past and understanding your present will help you get to a better future. And I think we do have a time for a few questions. Thank you, Sri. Oh, I don't. Okay, it's just it's late, but yes, um, that is a that I mean in open source, I think you find that the communities are actually really connected to each other. It's a shockingly small world, and so if you and chances are that people are heavily involved in a lot of different projects, and so if you find people that you know might be involved with that project the easiest thing to do is just ask them um or if you are part of maybe like an overarching group like uh maybe something like the cloud native foundation or a group that kind of ties a lot of communities together talk to them too and but yes but really it is a small world like so if i wanted to ask people how do you perceive the ubuntu community it would be really easy for me to find those people and find people who would give me an honest but useful answer and not just say oh you guys are great or you all suck so and so, yeah, just gay or grocery yeah or deb so um but ch chances are if you especially if you're new talk to someone who's more um who's more Establish. Chances are they have contacts, kind of in those or uh, in those groups outside of you, who could give you an honest perception of kind of what the general sentiment is towards your organization. But yeah, our social circles are super small. 
All right, any more questions? I was just thinking about um, book recommendations, People Powered by John O'Bacon. I also really like Get Together um, by People and Company because they are super goal focused. And especially if 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 you're kind of nonprofit, I would I think I might stress um, Get Together. <laughs> 